Right, well, I think we'll make a start because they're up to quite a nice level um, and we are just gone half past seven. So uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to what I know is going to be an enjoyable hour of uh, presentation and debate around uh, climate smart receding. Climate change is affecting all of us. We all know that. And for agriculture, um, the challenge is probably adapting our food production system to reduce the environmental impact that it has. We need to build uh, climate friendly farming systems uh, and we need to focus on finding new and better ways to improve our farming practices. Um, because I think just by being here tonight, we show that we all want to be part of a sort of su sustainable food production system. Grassland farming is uh, hugely significant to farmers, um, not only farmers, to, but to the wider public as well. Not, only, not because both in terms of their food production, but also the multiple ecosystems that grassland supports. And Germinal is helping to lead the way towards a climate smart food production. We're driving uh, uh, change through innovative forage breeding at Horizon to develop resource efficient varieties. So that's varieties of grass and clover that produce as much dry matter, as much digestibility and energy uh, with less resources using some less nutrients, um, water, light, uh, and, and all the elements, obviously, um, or more production for the same amount of those nutrients. Um, 20% of our workforce at Germinal, 20% of the people that work for Germinal are employed in research and development. So it gives you some idea of the importance we place on uh, innovation and reaching these net zero targets that our governments have signed up to. Um, and we're also sharing our the sort of receiving knowledge uh, to ensure that not only is the best coming from our land, but we're doing it in a sustainable and efficient way. And this is something that's not new to uh, Germinal. If you think about high sugar grass, uh, and the first variety was released in about 1998, and high sugar grass, for those of you who don't know, is where we have increased the water soluble carbohydrate level within the grass, uh, which helps feed the my rumen microflora, which is then enabling that to capture more of the plant protein uh, and convert it to amino acids to then produce more meat or milk in the animal. Um, on, the, on the environmental side of high sugar grass, we are reducing ammonia in dairy animals by as much as 24% and in sheep uh, lambs by uh, uh, methane by as much as 20%. Now this is not work, that, well, this is work that we've done, but this is peer reviewed science that other scientists have looked at the papers and said, yes, when you feed ABBA high sugar grass at scale, then these benefits are coming through. So this is not something that we've jumped on the bandwagon uh, in the last five years since these net zero um, uh, commitments have been made. This is something we've been working on for nearly 30 years now. The, the program started in 1988. So uh, we've been a long time on the high sugar story and uh, other interesting aspects are coming through as well. So with that said, I'm going to hand over to Mary, uh, Dr. Mary McAvoy, who is going to talk about receding and uh, making the decisions on, on what to receive. Thanks, Ben. My slides move on now. Yep. Um, so, yeah, so I suppose I'm going to talk a little bit about um, understanding why sword performance starts to drop off um, and identifying what, what to do. Maybe it's not as simple as just, you know, the grass is getting old. Maybe there's something else underlying, some other underlying issue going on that we need to rectify. So that's what I'm going to discuss here this afternoon or this evening. Um, so just as a brief over, overview, we'll talk about the benefits of receding. We'll do a talk about how we do a sword or soil health assessment. Um, and we'll talk about soil health in terms of, you know, the, the components and makeup and that are important to soil health being your biological, your physical and your chemical properties. So if we look at the average level of grass production, it's about seven tonnes on average of dry matter produced per hectare uh, across Ireland and the UK, probably slightly higher on dairy farms, um, both here and across the water. We have the potential through receding and through using the best genetics um, combined with good soil fertility and good soil health to achieve up to 12 to 14 tonnes of dry matter growing um, with well-managed new receipts. If we can increase grass utilised by one tonne of dry matter per hectare per year, 
Chagas have shown this to be worth 173 euros per hectare to dairy farmers um, and 105 euros per hectare per year to dry stock farmers. In terms of the benefits of re receding, look, I suppose a lot of people probably um, sitting in on this webinar are already well tuned into this, but we do see increased dry matter yields. So if we can increase um, or, or true receding and increasing the proportion of perennial ryegrass in a sward, we can see, see an increase in terms of total dry matter yield, but also seasonal dry matter yield. And that seasonal dry matter yield is probably nearly more important. So with newer plant genetics, you know, they are being bred and selected to grow more grass at the shoulders of the season. So increase your dry matter yield in the spring and increase your dry matter yield in the autumn. And if we can grow more at the shoulders of the season, we're offsetting a requirement for concentrate um, and silage. Um, and it's going to have a net benefit in terms of reducing the cost of producing meat or milk. But also there's an environmental benefit associated with that as well. If we're getting animals out to grass earlier, um, it is having a, a positive impact in terms of re reducing emissions. Um, we do see with perennial ryegrass dominated swords an improved response to nitrogen fertilizer. So, you know, sword, uh, true receding, you know, we're, we're seeing grasses which are, yield, are responding uh, to the tune of about 25 percent a greater response to applied fertilizer compa compared to older permanent pasture. And um, so, you know, we're under a. Uh, increased um, level of stringent rules and regulations in terms of our nitrogen use, we need to get smarter in terms of reducing the nitrogen we're using out on farms uh, from a water quality perspective, but also from a, an economic perspective as well. Um, and if we can make sure that the grasses we have in our swords are going to respond better to that applied fertilizer, well, that's going to be a win-win both for, for the farmer in terms of the, the pocket, but also um, for the environment. With perennial ryegrass dominated swords, we see better regrowth, and that's going to be really um, obvious now as we go into the second round. Um, so, you know, they will have greater potential to grow at cooler temperatures in, in the spring. So when grass is often tight out on farm as we approach the second round in, in you know, from, from now until the mid middle of April, those swords which are dominated by perennial ryegrass out on farm, you will see that there's more grass there following first grazing. Um, so they kind of get us out of that real tight, tight squeeze. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, the second round out on farms. We'll also see improved quality or dry matter digestibility with swords which are dominated by perennial ryegrass compared to old permanent pasture. And this will have a positive impact in terms of higher quality diet going into the animal. Um, and you're going to get better utilization of the protein. And so therefore you're going to less, get less in terms of losses of, in, of nitrogen um, in, in urine and feces, with urine in particular. And um, so there's an environmental benefit there as well. Um, and if we have increased intake of a higher quality feed, we're going to have an improvement in animal performance. So more meat or more milk produced. Um, and I suppose ultimately all these are leading to improved uh, and an in increase in farm profitability. Um, but there's also an environmental benefit or, or, or a, a net good there from an environmental perspective by having, you know, highly efficient swords which are utilizing the nutrient supplied which are grown better with lower levels of nitrogen input and so on and so forth. Um, Chagas have repeatedly shown that you know grass receding can give an excellent return on investment um, and a payback within two years and there's very few other on-farm investments where we can achieve um, that level of payback quite so quickly. In terms of understanding why swords might be declining in performance, um, I'm going to talk about that over the next couple of slides. So why are swords deteriorating, how we can assess underperforming swords, um, and how we can assess soil health to see if there's an underlying issue. I think too often we look at what's happening above the ground, we look at the, the sward, or we look at the animal performance, um, without paying pro proper attention to what's going on below the ground. Um, and you know it's really important that we have good, healthy soils um, on our farms um, into the future. We just quickly look, I suppose, at the difference in terms of some different species um, in terms of their total dry matter yield across the year. Um, and this is some work that was conducted at German Horizon in Wiltshire, which is our research farm um, in the south of England. It's showing, you know, you know, very good performance from your perennial ryegrass sward. But as the proportion of weed grasses, or if we, as I suppose we look at the, the, the yield of some of what we would traditionally call weed grasses, such as Yorkshire fogs, your bent grasses, your annual meadow grasses, you know, we're seeing a significant decline in terms of total dry matter yield. So if we're putting the same level of nitrogen out in some of those lower performing swords, we're not going to get the response. Um, and what you're going to see is losses to, the, to, to, to groundwater and runoff into rivers. So, you know, really important that we're, where we're using nitrogen fertilizer, we're making sure that it's going out on swords, which are going to give um, a, a proper response to that applied fertilizer. 
In terms of quantifying poorly performance fields, well, I suppose, how do we do it? So, you know, we need to know the reasons why we're selecting certain fields for receding and make, you know, the right decisions in terms of targeting those fields which aren't performing. So the easiest way to do this is through our weekly farm walk, okay? So, you know, if we're using um, a, a tool such as pasture base or something similar, um, you know, we can quantify the total production of that of the whole farm of every field on the farm right across the year so we can see what what for fields are performing well and what are suboptimal in terms of the performance and if we look at the sample i have here on the right hand side in this slide and um, you can see the red line is showing the average performance of this farm so you have a number of fields obviously well above that average but you have a few fields on the far right of that graph which are well below the average and you know they're the obvious ones you need to look at you need to understand why they're not performing um, and they're the first ones you'd look at to see if you need to rectify an issue with an issue with soil fertility or soil health or target for, for receding. In terms of those farms, I suppose, who aren't measuring grass or who aren't walking farm weekly, you know, even if you're if you, if you can record a number of grazings you're getting off certain off each field, you know, you'll have a good idea which fields are you, you're getting more grazing. Some fields you might be getting eight or nine grazings, other fields you might only be down at you know five or six, and that's a sure sign that they're not performing as well if you're not getting back into them as frequently. Um, if the silage, if you're cutting silage off fields and you know you're not getting as many trailers out through the gate, um, you know, that's another sign again that it's performance of that sward is starting to drop up, drop off. And I suppose we need to understand the reasons for some of this. Um, weed ingress is another issue. Um, and often we'll see weed ingress um, where you have issues such as compaction um, or poaching damage and where, you know, we're seeing a significant reduction in the proportion of perennial ryegrass in the sward. So where we're looking at less than 60% perennial ryegrass is starting to have an impact on the efficiency of that sward. Um, and, you know, we need to understand why what's causing that weed ingress um, and rectify the issue there as well. So it's really important that we know the cause of the of the problem. Um, and here's just a picture with um, you know a large proportion of weed grass is just in ingressing into this field. So you know, really useful to get an understanding of why this is happening, so we can rectify the issue and make sure when we recede it that it doesn't happen again. Essentially. So look, there can be a number of reasons as to why um, a sward deteriorates. Okay, so. Um, you know, it can be simply a factor of age. Um, we would recommend, and I suppose the recommendation out there is to recede 10 to 15% um, of the farm per year. And um, so, you know, every eight to 10 years, you're, you're receding the whole farm. Um, and, you know, the newer plant genetics are going to deliver more in terms of seasonal yield, in terms of quality compared to older genetics. So, you know, you will start to see that, you know, the newer or more recently receded fields on your farm um, ha, will, will per perform better than some of the older swords. And that can, you know, if, if your soil fertility and soil health is good, it can be just as simply a factor of older swords not doing as well. Um, soil issues that we tend to see is, you know, the most obvious one is fertility where we're doing a soil test and, you know, the pH, the P's or K, K levels are coming back on the low side. Um, and that can be relatively easily rec rectified, I suppose. And, you know, we would always say before you recede, do a soil test, know what your soil fertility status is, um, and if you have an issue, you know, correct that um, before, you, before you go to the cost and effort of receding. If compaction has occurred in a field, um, that's going to impact um, yield, the, 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 both the yield of the sward and uh, probably also results in an increase in the proportion of weeds in the field. Um, and this can happen as a result of animals. Um, we're after a very wet spring. Uh, it's nearly impossible to have animals out grazing there in the last you know, couple of weeks without some level of damage. Um, you know, if it's just surface damage, it can has it can possibly recover quite quickly. But you know, where they're where they're going down and doing deeper damage, that's going to have an impact in terms of the overall soil health. And machinery is probably the biggest thing we need to think about. And I'll talk about this in a few minutes again. Um, but I suppose you know, where most of us are using contractors now, machines are getting bigger and bigger. Um, but we need to, where possible, start thinking about when do these machines are traveling ground, um, because you know, when ground is saturated as it, as it is as it is there at the moment. Um, you know, we're seeing a significant impact of traveling ground with machinery in terms of losses, in terms of subsequent performance of those wards as a result of compaction that's occurring along the tram lines. OK, um, in terms of silage harvesting, it can be um, extremely uh, difficult or I suppose extremely hard on grasses. Um, and often we'll see where we're continuously taking two or three cuts of silage. Those wards are only lasting six or seven years. And if we think about this, when we're continuously cutting grasses down to a very low level after taking a heavy crop off them, it takes a while for them to recover. 
there's no green leaf left on the grass essentially after a cut of silage. So the plant is having to take energy from its root reserves to, to put leaf up so it can start to photosynthesize and take energy from the sun again. Okay. Um, and you know that that continuous continual cycle um, of you know taking heavy crops of silage and putting them very low will deplete the, 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 the plant of its energy root reserves eventually and it'll just kind of you know run out run out of steam as such. And again, you know, weed ingress and all of the above issues, I suppose, can result um, in, you know, an increase in the proportion of weeds coming into coming into the sward. So I suppose, you know, it's really important that we do understand why a sward is, in, is underperforming. And, you know, we do we do get calls from people and look, looking to recede. And when you start to question and ask the reasons why you realize that there's some other issue happening there and, you know, going out and doing a full recede isn't necessarily going to, to fix the problem if we don't event, um, essentially identify the root cause of the problem in the first place. So if we think about soil, it's it's, you know, the most valuable probably asset we have on our farms, aside from from our people, of course. Um, it's probably the most diverse habitat or soil is considered the most diverse habitat on the planet and ha houses a gr greater than a quarter of all life on this planet. OK, so it's really, really important um, that we manage our soils well um, and ensure, you know, the health of our soils. And I suppose there's three main components that go into making up a healthy soil. You have the biological component, which is a living aspect of your soil, which is your bacteria, your fungi, your earthworms. Um, obviously, you can't really see the bacteria or fungi, but, you know, earthworms are, are very visible in a healthy soil. You have the chemical components, which is your soil pH, your P's, um, your K and your, your, your nitrogen proportion. Um, and you also have the physical proportion, OK, which is, you know, the structure of, of, of the soil, the physical makeup of the soil. And, you know, the simplest tool on the farm is our spade. Um, really worthwhile if you think a field isn't performing as you would expect it should get a spade, go out, dig a few holes, and it's amazing what you can learn from looking below the ground. Um, <clears throat> if we, the, a VEST chart, which is a visual evaluation of soil structure, this was first developed by the Scottish Agricultural College, um, and Shags now have a version as well, but really, it's a really, really simple tool. If you Google uh, soil vest assessment and um, it'll come up at top as top of the google searches there um, and you can print off um this chart which is a really useful tool to have to take out into field which it, if you're not really sure what you're looking at when you dig below the ground okay so with this it tells you what you need to do so essentially all you need to do is go out into a field with with a spade um and you're essentially digging digging a hole to have a look at what's going on below the ground so you want to stick the spade down in three, three spots and essentially flip over the soil. So you, you have one side, which you haven't sheared, um, sheared with, the, with the spade um, and have a look at, you know, the, the, the porosity within that soil, the size of your aggregates and um, we'll smell it, um, you know, and, and you get a good feel for how healthy your soil is by, you know, just a, a, a very simple, simple look at the soil. So within each layer, I suppose, when you do that vest assessment, you'll break up the soil and assess the soil of the aggregates. Generally, the larger the aggregate, it's a, si a sign of poor quality in terms of your soil structure. Um, and also we look at the shape of those aggregates. So sharper, more angular shapes, um, again, indicate poor structure. So what you're looking for basically is, you know, very small aggregates or a range of different sizes in terms of your aggregates, but those which break up e easily. So we break them up firstly between your finger and thumb. Um, and if they break up e very easily, that's a very good sign of a good healthy soil. Um, if you need to, you know, break it with your hand, you know, your obviously your aggregates are bigger, they're more difficult to break, you know, that's not not so good, but you will also have, you know, in very poor quality soils where there's a lot of compaction, you know, ones you physically nearly can't break uh, with your hand even, okay. Um, so with a healthy soil, you want to look at the root depth, you want um, a, 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 roots that are going down vertically through the soil and not kind of going across, across, you know, the top inch or so, so you want good um, dispersion of your roots vertically throughout the soil. Um, you want a good friable soil, so one that breaks up easily, as I say, um, small aggregate size is, is a sign for of better soil structure. Uh, you want good porosity within your soil, so plenty of pores. So those pores are going to be made by earthworms traveling through the soil, by your roots, um, which will, you know, you'll have a certain level of root turnover on a continual basis. Some roots will be, you'll get new development of new roots and older roots dying back. And these all help open up um, and improve the porosity of the soil. That porosity is important to ensure uh, good air and water moving through the soil. Um, and obviously that's essential for, for life, life within the soil, that they have good air and water moving through the soil. Um, earthworms are a very visible sign of a good, a good healthy soil. 
Um, you also want to look at the color and the smell of your soil. Okay, so, so a healthy so soil should smell. Um, it should smell nice. Essentially, it should have a good earthy smell. Um, if you have, you know, a poor, poor drainage within your soil, then you can have a foul or putrid smells, um, and it can also be a sign of poor structural quality. And I suppose this is probably a fairly extreme picture that I'm going to show here, but, um, you know, in, in the soil you're seeing very large. Um, Angular aggregates, you know, very, very difficult to break, uh, e even in, when, when holding or squish, squashing between the whole hand and um, poor porosity within the soil. You can see, you know, well, hopefully you can see and if you're looking at this on the phone, maybe you might not be able to see, but you can see um, basically um, kind of this orange mottling here, which is a sign of poor drainage. Um, and you know also a sign of compaction within the soil. So there are some things to look out for. Now that is a pretty an extreme um, sample of a of a poor soil, but you know it, it is something that we, we do see on occasion. And I suppose an awful lot of what we do to our soils can be influenced by management. So you know obviously we're all well aware that you know we want to minimise poaching damage. That's going to have a ne negative impact on our soil. Machinery is probably one of the bigger problems. Obviously machines are getting bigger. Um, you know, all the time. Um, and we're seeing an increase in terms of compaction uh, caused by some of these machines. So your tire pressure is going to be important here, but also your timing. You know, we really need to think about when we're traveling our soils. Um, and just because we can't necessarily see the damage above ground, you know, don't underestimate the damage you could be doing by traveling ground at the moment. Um, you know, where soil is saturated, it's going to be much more prone to, to compaction and damage by traveling with machinery. If we're consistently, you know, removing and taking away from the soil and not replacing what we're taking off, that's going to deplete, deplete your soil fertility. Um, and I suppose in terms of this, you know, we, we do often see this in terms of silage ground in particular, where, um, you know, two or three cuts of silage coming off a field. Um, and we're not really paying attention to the amount of offtake we're taking from that field. And therefore, you know, there's not sufficient P or generally K in particular going back out on silage ground. Um, and again, that runs down the, the overall fertility of your soil. So, Simple kind of rule of thumb for every ton of dry matter we're removing um, in, in silage harvesting, you know, you want to be replacing about 25 kilos of K back onto that, back onto that field to replace your offtakes. Um, but, you know, it's about maintaining our optimum level of soil indices um, and replacing those offtakes. Bare soils, probably not so much of an issue, obviously, in terms of our audience here tonight, Ben, um, you know, more of an issue on, on tillage ground. Um, but obviously, look, we're all well aware if we have bare soils and, you know, exposure to the rain that we're after having there over the last couple of weeks or we're after having on this side of the water over the last couple of weeks, anyhow, um, you know, you're increasing your risk of, um, of erosion, of runoff, of loss of nutrients um, and of leaching from, from soils into our waterways as well. And that's all going to have a negative impact in terms of soil health, but also on our water quality and, you know, um, you know, we're coming under increasing scrutiny to improve water quality um, in order to be continue to allow do what we have been doing in terms of agriculture. Um, and also, I suppose, water logging. OK, so, um, you know, if you're on a floodplain, obviously, there's not much you can do about this. But like, um, you know, true compaction, we do see, you know, we, we, we are we'll often see or hear of someone say, you know, never had an issue with water line in that field before. And again, you go out and dig it and just a compaction, you know, the top couple of inches um, and water is just not able to get down through the soil and not get away. Um, and that has a negative impact then on the on the soil as well. In terms, of, in terms of things that we can do that are good for our soil, you know, we need to optimize our soil fertility. So we need to be doing regular soil tests. Um, make sure that your soil is in the optimum situation for pH. So for grasslands, you know, you're talking about a pH of 6.3, where it's seen increased use of clovers and multi-species um, over the last couple of years, and that's going to grow uh, going forward as well. Um, so I suppose your, your pH, you know, where we talk about 6.3 for grassland, we're probably going to start talking about 6.5 plus, uh, even up to 7 for, for um, uh, swords, which have a good proportion of clover included in them. Farmyard manure um, is, is a really valuable asset on a farm and um, it helps build up the organic organic matter. And often, I suppose, um, or we've seen in, in recent years, a lot of conversion from tillage to dairy here in Ireland. Um, and, you know, your, your soil fertility might look good on paper, but the sward doesn't perform as you would expect. So, like, you know, you might be finding that your yields are four or five tons lower than you would have expected based on the, the soil, um, the soil test reading. Um, and that's a sign that like, the organic matter has been de um, depleted in those soils and putting out farming yard manure, feeding the bugs, feed feeding the earthworms, 
will help get that, that cycle going. It'll build up your organic manure or the organic matter in your soil um, and help in terms of overall uh, performance from those forts. And again, I suppose cover cropping, again, probably more relevant to tillage ground compared to, to compared to grassland, obviously. But again, you know, any tillage ground where you're exposing or having bare soils, you know, going out with a cover crop has been so, shown to have huge beneficial effects in terms of improving health of the soil um, over the winter period um, and leaving uh, resulting in higher returns from the from the subsequent crop. Prevention is always better than cure. Um, you know, if we can avoid doing the damage in the first place, it's much better than having to go out and try to correct a problem that we have created. And, um, you know, people will often ask about the use of aerators and things like that, where they think they have a compaction issue. Um, but again, you're just going out with another heavy machine to do to do work that has been created, caused in the first place, probably by heavy machines. So, you know, we need to be a little bit more sensible in terms of managing, managing our soils going forward to try and minimise the damage that we do, do to them and do what we can to optimise the health of our soils overall. In terms of soil fertility, um, soil testing is absolutely essential. If we don't know the, the fertility or the status of our soils, how do we know what nutrients we need to put out to optimize or to optimize the, the performance of, this, of, the, of the crop we're trying to grow? Um, where we have low pHs, um, we're seeing a loss in the region of one and a half tons of dry matter per hectare. Um, but there's also other, other effects in terms of low pH. So if we can correct the soil pH where we have had an issue, we can release up to 80 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. Um, compared to, to a lime deficient soil. And obviously that's going to be hugely beneficial. Nitrogen is not cheap at the moment. It might be dropping in price, but it's not, as, it's not as cheap as it was a couple of years ago. So, you know, we have that resource available in our soil, correct our soil pH, and, you know, it, it's free nitrogen as such. Um, if we optimize our pH, P and K that are in the soil become more available. So often we'll see, you know, a, a field where the P or K reading was low, where we go out and correct pH without putting any P or K. And I'll show you a study in a moment which, which proves this. Um, but where we correct our pH, the P or K indices came up subsequently. And that's just because we have had at low pHs, those nutrients have been locked up um, and they are released then within the soil once the pH um, comes up to the optimum. And we also see an increased efficiency in the use of applied fertilizers where our soil pH um, is optimized. So, you know, it's probably, you know, one of the cheaper fertilizers we can buy out on farm. Um, lime is probably costing around 27 euros per, uh, per ton spread at the moment in Ireland. So really, really good value um, to, to correct an issue where, where you have an issue. OK, and we're still in a scenario, I suppose, where, um, you know, 20% of dairy soils, um, or only 20% of dairy soils in, in Ireland are optim optimized for pH, P and K. So, you know, we really need to improve um, our soil health or our soil fertility status um, and get that number up um, in order to, you know, maximize the return we're getting from our applied, in input, applied inputs, but also, I suppose, from an environmental perspective to make sure that our soils are as healthy as they can be. Where P levels are low, we're seeing a loss of one and a half tons of dry matter per hectare. And where K is low, we're seeing a loss of up to three tons dry matter per hectare in our soilage swords. So again, significant losses by having these sub, sub, suboptimal in terms of our um, in, in terms of our soil fertility. This work was conducted um, 10 years ago, actually, this year um, down in Johnstown Castle, but I think it's just a really interesting slide um, and still very relevant uh, today. So what I'm going to show you basically is um, the change in soil p-test 12 months after, um, after the treatment. So in the first instance, so, so that bar you're seeing up there in your screen at the moment, um, is our control. So we've got no P, so no phosphorus, and no lime was applied. applied. 12 months later, virtually no change um, in its soil p-test. Where we only applied lime, and five tonnes of lime per hectare was applied um, to this treatment, the the P reading increased significantly from 0.8 up to 5.7. So that, that in, in an Ireland context, and I know it's a slightly different um, way of measuring soil P in the UK, but in an Irish context, that's bringing us from an index one up to an index three, simply by applying lime. Where you only applied phosphorus and 100 kilos of phosphorus per hectare was applied in this trial, it increased up to um, 8.1. And where we applied both phosphorus and lime, we saw a significant improvement in the soil p-test 12 months um, after the application. So basically what I want to really emphasize here is by just applying lime to, to this soil, you know, the index improved from an index one to an index three. And that's the optimum of where we need to be for, for grassland production. And um, so, you know, it just really shows the importance of correcting soil 
pH as a first and foremost starting point um, if you have an issue with it, because it, it allows nutrients in the soil to become more available um, and you'll get a subsequent significant improvement in terms of soil performance. Now I'm almost finished um, here, but before I go, and I, I suppose, you know, I haven't, and we're not going into grass varieties to any great degree um, in this evening's, um, this evening's webinar, but, you know, I just want to emphasize the importance when you are receding this year, to use the grass recommended list. So there's an Irish grass and white clover recommended list. There's one for England and Wales, and there's also a Scottish recommended list. Within these lists, all these varieties are evaluated under local conditions. So we know that those varieties are going to perform uh, when they're sown in the, in the local area, um, and they're going to give you the best return on the investment of receding. Receding isn't going to be cheap. You're probably looking at 750 to 800 euro a hectare. Um, for the cost of receding this year. So it is really important when we are receding, you know, we want these grasses to last for eight to 10 years out on our farm. It's really important we put out the best available grasses that are here today to maximize the return on the investment there again. Okay, your ideal sowing rate is 14 kilos of, uh, of grass seed per, per acre or 35 kilos per hectare. And I think we're probably gone from the day um, where we, you know, talk about perennial ryegrass monocultures. And, um, you know, at this stage of virtually, you know, all swords being receded are including white clover, We're talking about medium leaf white clovers for, for dairy systems and small leaf clovers for, for sheep systems, okay? Clover has a huge potential to increase or, or release up to 150 kilos of nitrogen. And um, so, you know, that's freely available by having, you know, a good healthy clover uh, in the sward. Ideally, you want about 30%, 25 to 30% clover in the sward across the year that can release up to 150 kilos of nitrogen significantly reducing our dependency on the bag um, and you know that's a key target from the Irish government to reduce the use of nitrogen um, over the next couple of years um, and that's going to have a massive impact in terms of um, the environmental credentials associated with intensive agriculture um, as if we can reduce the nitrogen we're going to um, hopefully see a beneficial effect in terms of reducing leaching and losses to, to our waterways so you'll have an improvement in water quality there as well. OK, we have always also in the last you know, couple of years seen a significant increase in the interest of multi-species swords um, and also red clover for silage. Look, we don't have time to discuss those here this evening, unfortunately, but anyone who wishes to follow up to either ourselves here in Ireland or the UK team over the next couple of days, either by phone or email, we'd be more than happy to answer questions um, or any questions you have on, on either of those. So, you know, don't don't be afraid to pick up the phone and give us a call and we'll help you out if we can draw um, just to summarise, Ben, and this is my last slide, um, you know, really important when we're talking about receding to, to understand your soil, to assess your soil and to know if, you know, your sward isn't performing as you would expect, why, what, what's the cause of that? Um, and, you know, if there is an issue to correct those issues before we go to the, the cost of receding. Um, so, you know, to correct soil fertility issues if they're there or to think about our soil health there as well. We need to be using um, recommended list varieties um, in our mixes. Um, and I'd say, you know, pick up a copy of those recommended lists. They're all available online and just, you know, they're, they're provide useful information in terms of better performing varieties or those varieties which are more suited to, to, to local conditions. Um, so, look, that's it for me, everyone. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and if you have any quick questions, I think we might take one or two now, Ben, or will we hold off till the end? Yeah, no, we'll, we'll hold off to the end. There's one question that I'll uh, take now while... Uh... William and Mary are changing their slides yeah. over from, from Michael. Uh, is there enough research done on multi-species swords, uh, poor in siling and short lifespan? Uh, the short answer to that, Michael and everybody else is no, there isn't. Um, we are doing a lot at the Germinal Horizon Wiltshire site um, where we've been, we're just about to drill another session of multi-species trials. We've had one in for, uh, spring 2020, so whatever that is, three and a bit years now, um, and and that's proving uh, very helpful in us guiding people on on what multi species is doing. And on the back of that, in response to your short lifespan, we have started a plantain breeding program because one of the elements and one of the problems with multi species lays is some of the herb elements are only lasting uh, uh, two three years. So having a breeding program on the plantain we're hoping one of the main goals of that is longevity to to increase the lifespan of that plantain because of the benefits that, that brings um if you want more information on multi-species as mary said we haven't got cover it, time to cover it now please pick up the phone for us but there's also on the knowledge hubs on both websites germinal ie 
and Germinal GB. At the top of the bar of the website is a knowledge hub. You click on that, there are webinars that we've done historically, uh, specifically on multi-species. Mary's did a presentation and Professor Tommy Boland did one from UCD uh, with us, uh, proving the live weight gains, the uh, heavier weaning weights of lambs, the quicker time to, to, to slaughter. And uh, actually in his experiment, uh, the animals we use it, we were using less anthelmintics as well. So there are benefits to multi-species. It's not the answer to everything. And we preach that religiously. You know, it, it doesn't sort every problem out, but there are some big benefits to multi-species, uh, especially when you consider uh, the environment and the lightweight gains that can be can be had from using your own land and multi species uh, within it. Right, William, uh, over to you now, and uh, you're going to talk about receding and the how. Okay, doke. Thanks, Ben, uh, and thanks to Mary for our receding and why we should be going about doing it. In this section, I'm going to be looking and discussing the the practical elements of receding, um, and just emphasising what Mary was saying about assessing what you've already got on farm is that sword walk, taking your spade, as Mary said, those are the fundamental things and looking at the records that you've got before you start to think about reseeding. And Mary discussed the soil testing, the, and I can't stress enough how important it is to do your soil testing in plenty of time so that you are able to rectify any issues with a pH and P and K because just applying um, lime, it doesn't act straight away. You've got to get allow it time to have an impact on your soil pH and for it to um, have that impact and raise it to that 6.2 to 6.5 that we're looking for, for the optimum nutrient availability for the swords. So moving on, um, one of the things that we get discussed and debated about quite a bit is the time of year for a reseed. Um, and Mary's part of the world in Ireland and spring reseeds are the norm. And in Scotland, where I'm based, we had a have a predominance of spring reseeds. Um, but the further south you go in the country, the more autumn reseeds that are there. But really, I don't have any specific um, favourite way of doing it. I don't really care whether you do it in the spring or the autumn. The most important thing is to start with a plan in plenty of time so that you get the best chance of success in that reseed following on from some of the things that Mary's been talking about there. But looking at our spring reseed, generally speaking, we're at a time of year when soil temperatures are rising and there's enough moisture in the soil to get a fast germination and establish those new seeds. Um, there is a, an issue with weed control there because just because the soil is warm and your grass is establishing quickly, so also are your weeds. So you have to be able to nip them at the seedling stage to get them sprayed off at the right time. And um, because you're doing a reseed in the spring, you're missing that um, early spring growth and that peak of grass growth in the season when you're doing that reseed. So that first year when you put it in, you're going to have less grass there. So it's worth factoring that into any of your calculations in terms of stocking rates, et cetera. And we'll talk about the methods of reseeding in a minute or two, but depending on how you do it, it can take time for the soil to be back to its full carrying capacity. If you plough it, it's going to be more tender. It takes time to settle before you can travel with uh, either machines or get stock onto it. You need to be careful in how you do it. We've got down there an opportunity for a break or a catch crop. Given the fact that we now don't have dirge band to control leather jackets and wireworm, um, a grass to grass reseed in the spring, the greatest risk, certainly where I am, of problems is with leather jackets. So if you've got a grass to what to do a grass to grass reseed, it's perhaps worth thinking about having a, an autumn brassica that can be grazed into the back end of the year to break that pace cycle and reduce the risk from damage from your new grass reseed from leather jackets. And um, it's worth considering those things. Um, moving on to autumn reseeding and the autumn reseed would really mean any time from the end of July onwards. And the cutoff point for that depends on how far north you are in the country and also your altitude above sea level. So that's going to have a, an impact 
on the weather window and the opportunity you have to get an autumn reseed in there. Um, the benefit of an autumn reseed is you've had that spring period to get as much grass from that field, even though it's not as good, and you've still had the peak production from it before you do your autumn reseed. And over the course of the winter, the field has time to settle. And when you go into your, um, your first full year's production, you get the full benefit of having that extra 25% of grass production minimum that Mary was talking about earlier. Um, there is also less of a, a weed burden in the back end of the year, but that's because the soils are the soils are cooling down, daylight's getting shorter, but that's also having a potentially going to have an impact on how well your grass establishes. So you need to try and hit that sweet spot to get the grass established before the, the day length and the soil temperatures get too low. We've put there an opportunity for a break crop with a question mark. And the reason for that being in there is that we've had several dry summers in parts of the countryside. So if you're on a drought prone farm, the opportunity is there to take that field out in the spring, late April, early May, put it into a summer brassica to graze through that potentially dry period of the summer before you go back in with an autumn reseed in July, early August and to, to help fill that hungry gap during the mid season because it's becoming more and more common that the shoulders of the season, we have plenty of grass and it's during the mid season when we start to struggle. Um, looking at what the cultivation technique is going to be, there's a whole host of them there. And really I have no personal preference on it. Um, it's all down to the farm and what their preference is and their expertise and their experience in doing it. The most important thing, regardless of the method that you're going to use, is attention to detail. We may think that some of these methods that we're going on to are easier and cheaper ways of doing a reseed. That's only the case if the attention to detail is there and they're done properly so that you get the full benefit and the best possible chance of a successful reseed. The first one I'm going to talk about is minimum tillage. There's lots and lots of different drills on the market now. Um, you've got discs, you've got slots, you've got air drills. The big benefit of a uh, minimum tillage is the fact that you're not turning over the soil. As long as you've got a good soil structure, you're not going to have to turn it over and start again. Um, and therefore, you're not releasing as much carbon out into the atmosphere, which is something that as an industry, both in Ireland and here in, in the UK, we've been challenged to reduce our carbon footprints. So minimum tillage has a place to play in it. But the drill is the, the last, least important aspect of this operation. The most important aspect of it is how you deal with the old sward that you're trying to destroy before you, you go and drill it. It's really important to break up any thatch that's there, get rid of that, and create that, a fine, firm seed bed so that you've got the best possible opportunity for your new seedlings to establish. A method that's becoming more and more common is direct drilling. And that's where you have to spray off the old sward, give it um, the manufacturer's withhold period before you go in and either cut it and gra or graze it down. But the important thing here is to try and remove as much of that uh, old material that you've sprayed off as possible before you direct drill in. Because one of the things that we see and we get called out to on a regular basis is where somebody has direct drilled it but they've left too much of the dead decaying material because as that material decays, it acidifies and that increases the risk of scorching and burning these new seedlings which are tender and delicate and can in instances actually burn them out. So you need to get rid of as much of that dead decaying material as possible. And in instances I've seen us saying to people, get a set of harrows before you go and do it to rip out all the thatch and make sure you get it open and get good seed to soil contact. And it's the same thing in this situation as what we're talking about. Think about the pH, make sure you get the pH and P's and K's done and um, up to where they need to be at 6.5 and the good K indexes and P indexes to get a good successful establishment. A method of reseeding which has fallen out of favour largely is using cereals as a break crop. In a lot of instances, this was used uh, certainly in central Scotland as a 
a method of still getting some production from a field when you were going to be reseeding it. Um, the cereals were put in as normal, but the important thing was this reduced a uh, seed rate because the important part is you're trying to establish a good quality grass laying below it, but you still then get it off early and it's a, a fermented whole crop to be able to get into that sward and let the, the, the grass established before the ground gets tender. And it's really, really important if this method is used that you take the cereal off when the ground conditions are good because the last thing you want to do is go in there and damage the fresh grass reseed because that's the important part. It's not the cereal or the whole crop. The important part is the, the grass reseed that you're going to do, but it's not something we see much nowadays. It's going to, as I say, largely fallen out of fashion. I have left perhaps the most um, favoured way of doing a reseed to last, the full plough. Um, historically, this was the way we always did it, but there are reasons in that we, we would try to avoid it nowadays. The big one is, is the carbon release, but also as Mary said with our slide there about the soil being the engine to production, we're looking at, look at trying to look after the soil biology. And earthworms, as Mary talked about, they are the, kind of, the peak indicator of a healthy soil. And every time you go through a field with a plough, you have the number of earthworms there. So you really, have to think seriously in terms of our carbon release and also in terms of the soil health or the soil biology health about whether a plough is the, the correct way to go forward. And um, there are instances when, yes, it is um, essential if there's been a lot of poaching and it's the only way to reset the field, but think about it before you do it. And there's also the other element to consider there is the fact that when you turn it over, there's a lot of um, weeds, seeds in the soil, and some of these weed seeds can last there for a long, long time. So when you bring them to the surface, you're giving them that opportunity to establish and to germinate and cause you a problem that then needs to be sprayed out. So there are times when ploughing is not the answer, particularly when we see this work that was done uh, by Crichton in Ireland but it shows you the yield in the first full year of production after a reseed. You look there, there's only um, 400 kilos of dry matter between ploughing and a, a direct drilling method of establishing a new reseed. But think about the extra cost involved in doing that full plough reseed against the di direct drilling method um, and also the damage that you're doing to the soil biology and perhaps soil structure as well, if it, depending on the time of year. One of the most important things after you get a, a, a new lay established is managing that new lay and trying to get rid of those seedling um, weeds um, as early as possible and being able to manage that grass um, so that you get the best benefit of it and in color, encourage tillering um, is to go out there, get it between your, your thumb and your first finger and tear it to try and see that pull taste. If the leaf tears off, and leaves the roots in the bottom of the plant there, it's able to be grazed. If you pull it out by the roots, then it's needing time to, to strengthen and uh, get better rooted into the soil before you graze it. And managing that new lay is really, really crucial to getting the best return on your investment because getting stock onto it, grazing it down, will encourage it to till it, but not overgrazing it is really important because you want to get good ground cover to reduce your weed levels and promote the tillering by, by grazing. Moving on to one of the things that we're here quite a lot about is overseeding. This term can be misleading and some people refer to overseeding as direct drilling where they're, they're destroying the old sward and starting from scratch. Overseeding as I understand it, is when you're trying to rejuvenate the sward that's already there. So that's one of the most important things is to get that um, clear in your head what you're actually trying to do. Are you burning it off and starting again or are you re re rejuvenating? And this section here is just talking about rejuvenating it. So what are your decisions for rejuvenating it? You're looking for over 60% of that existing sward to be the species that you're sowing. So you're looking for perennial ryegrass and clover to be there. If you've got a, a large weed burden, 
over 15%, for example, then you have to seriously think about whether it's you need to control those weeds before you overseed it or whether you're then heading towards needing to destroy it and, and start again with a full new reseed. The bottom picture there um, is a classic example of a really old sward. There's a lot of thatch there. That's not a candidate for uh, overseeding and rejuvenation because it's so matted that there's no way you're going to get the good seed to soil contact required. And not only that, the important thing for the new seedlings is to get light down there so that they can establish and photosynthesize and strengthen the, the, the root system of the young plant. And there's no way you're going to be able to get it down well enough in that situation. So which sorts of seeds would you use if you are uh, overseeding? Well, we would always aim, and when you're rejuvenating a sward, to use a tetraploids. And the reason for that is a tetraploid is a bigger seed. It has more energy in it, so it gets away quicker. And it has also got a more upright growth pattern than the than, than diploid grass, grass varieties. So that gets allows it to get up and compete with the existing sward and photosynthesize to establish itself. Um, we're looking in this situation to be doing about 10 kilos to the acre for a grass overseed rejuvenation. If you're trying to put in um, white clover, for example, which is really important given the, the drive to reduce our fertilizer use, you're looking at a kilo to two kilos, probably two kilos an acre um, of straight white clover mix to establish. Um, Oh, so what are the, the ways to get a successful establishment? Well, the same rules in terms of your soil pH, soil structure, uh, as a full reseed apply. We're really looking to get, um, we need to get seed to soil contact. That's the most important thing. We really want to try and get rid of any old thatch that's there, clean it out, make sure you've sprayed off any of your weeds and try to do it particularly after, I would say for grass in particular, you want to do it after the spring flush has passed, perhaps um, the end of May, early, middle of June onwards, when the soils are still warm, but your grass is past that, the, the peak of its growing, um, and then you get a chance to get it when there's still moisture there established. Um, if you're overflowing clover into an existing sward, you need to make sure it's clean. Um, you also want to try and get it grazed down really tight to make sure that the, you get light down there. Um, ideally, either after a hard grazing, certainly, or after a silage cut is an ideal time to get clover into it. I know that there's, um, in Mary's part of the world, they're moving towards putting clover in at times in the spring of the year, but that's where they're on um, really good rotational grazing and hitting residuals of the four centimetres but if you're putting clover into it, you really want to try and make sure that you're hitting those residuals and, and reducing the amount of fertilizer that you're applying. If it's late in the season and it's grass you're doing, then preferably no nitrogen fertilizer for the rest of the season to allow the young grass seedlings to get up. And because when you're putting fertilizer on, all you're doing is feeding the existing plant, plants that are already established, and then they outcompete with the, the new seeds that are there. When you're introducing clover to it, ideally get stock back in about a week to 10 days after you've sown the clover to graze it down, hit that four centimetre, 1500 kilograms a uh, dry matter residual, and preferably don't put any nitrogen on for at least another two rounds um, and graze it for the clover in particular, graze that sword again every couple of weeks for three turns to try and give the best possible chance of establishment. There are a lot of uh, pros and cons to overseeding. Obviously, cost is a big element of it. Um, you are getting the opportunity to introduce new, um, higher yielding varieties that are going to increase the lifespan of the existing sward. You're getting a chance to introduce clover, which, given the environmental pressures in terms of reducing our um, greenhouse gas emissions on farm, getting clover into a sward is really, uh, it's the easy, quick hit to try and help you reduce your carbon footprint as long as you manage it correctly in terms of reducing 
your fertilizer applications because as Mary said earlier, you've got that opportunity to get 150 kilograms of nitrogen for free from the, the clover plant there. And the cons to it, the downsides to it is if you don't get a good enough um, clean out of the sward before you establish it, you've got to get rid of some of that dead and decaying material, eat it well down, make sure that you've had a walk over the field to make sure that there are no um, compaction issues that you haven't seen. Um, and also if you're in a situation where there's potential for these for soil pests in wireworm or leather jackets, it's worth getting it checked before you go and do it to make sure you're not um, doing something that's not going to be successful. And in summary, the really important two things that I can't highlight enough is have a plan. Start out in plenty of time, get those soil tests done. That's the, the crucial part of it, get the, the pH right, because as many said, if you can get your um, pH right, you can save yourself uh, 80 units of nitrogen just by having the pH at the right level. The timings for a reseed, really to me, they don't matter. It's either the spring or autumn, it's whatever is most appropriate and suits the farming system best, um, but start in plenty of time. And I can't emphasize enough what Mary said in her last slide, the recommended lists, they are independently verified varieties that have, are equal to or better than others. So that's your guide for making sure that you get the best quality material that's there. Um, if there's anything else or any questions, as Mary said, please get in contact with any of us at the over the phone or email. We're more than happy to discuss things privately if you wish. And that concludes uh, my comments, Ben. So if there's any questions, we'll hand back to, to you. Brilliant. Thank you, William. Thank you, William. Keep your questions coming in, because even if we don't get to them tonight, uh, we will... Uh, try and ask them on the email chain that follows. Uh, a few questions here so far. Um, any comments on sulphur and grass? Mary, you're on mute, I think, at the moment. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, look, so sulphur, sulphur, I suppose, it's an essential um, in terms of, uh, it's essentially a building block in amino acids. So it's essential for the plant to be able to make protein. Um, and I suppose back in the day, sulphur came from um, heavy industry and was released in the air, was made available um, through deposits to, to grass. Um, and obviously that's not the case anymore. Um, so sulphur, um, especially on lighter, freer draining soils, it's really important. Um, need about 20 kilos of uh, sulfur per hectare per year in grazing ground. So as a ratio of your nitrogen to sulfur, you're looking at about 12 to 1. Um, and for silage ground, you want about 20 kilos of sulfur per cut across the year. Okay, so for two cuts, you'd be you know, obviously going out with 40 kilos. Um, little and often approach is the best way to apply it. So, um, you know, generally, from from this time from this time onwards, maybe every second round, go with a product that has um, a, a small amount of sulfur and go little and often, you know. And it, it is really important and will help in terms of overall performance from the sword. Brilliant, thank you. Um, one question here that I might take, or William, you can if you want to. Are red clover based swords suitable for multi cut systems? It. <sighs> The multi-cut system, it depends on the, the simple answer would be yes, but really you have to think about the, the timings between, if you're cutting it every four weeks, as some people are, then getting the red clover plant to the optimum point for its quality, it's not going to hit that. You need it nearer between five and six weeks to get to its, its optimum point. So therefore you have to think about what you're trying to achieve if you're going to have the red clover in. Um, so it, yes is the simple answer. The management of it is more complicated, I would say, to get the benefit of it. And you also have to remember to get allow your red clover plant to flower once a year, um, preferably third or fourth cut later in the season to build up the root reserves to aid the persistency of the red clover plant. Unless there's anything you want to add to that, Ben. Well, no, just, I, I, I'd say that to get the maximum out of the red clover plant, it does need to be 
six weeks between cutting, which is why we always you know, talk about using it with a perennial ryegrass crop rather than an Italian crop, because the Italian grasses would be too far gone to be cutting at that period. It will help with multi-cut systems if you're on four weeks, but the benefit of it is going to be reduced, isn't it, um, over, over that longer period. Um, okay, good. There's another question here. Uh, briefly, how would you go about, I think you covered this a bit, renewing pastures that you know are full of wireworm and leather jackets. Um, is it a treated cereal seed and then a brassica rape crop? Is that the only control? If if you have got the um, the scope within your rotation to do that, then yes, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, the challenge is a lot of farms may struggle to be able to take a field out, have it for a cereal for a year, and then a brassica. Um, in an ideal world, a treated cereal seed would be is the answer. Um, but there are a lot of instances where they're struggling and they don't have the either the the scope, the uh, the knowledge, or the desire to grow cereals. And if there's no desire to do that, then you have to think about introducing a brassica um, and going in probably anytime from end of June to middle of August to graze in the back end of the year so that you're reducing the, the burden from it. Um, it's still going to be a risk. It's still going to need to be watched. But in an ideal world, yes, your questioner is right. A cereal and then a brassica would be brilliant. But we don't all live in an ideal world, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, uh, one more here. Um, here, how come dots appear in my in a reseed? You say my reseed, to be fair. How come dots appear in a reseed? Uh, was done in the spring a few years ago. Either of you want to? Take yeah, that. so I'll take that, sure. Um, yeah, look, so I mean, a, a dock seed um, can last quite a long time in the soil, I suppose. And if you think of a dock plant, that has cap the capacity to produce 80,000 seeds in a year. So you can have a huge, from one plant, you know, it, it can spread quite quickly. Um, soils that are pr probably high in K are more prone to having docks um, and it can get spread in slurry. Um, so um, as well as that, if you've done any damage, if you're poaching damage or bare spots, it gives you the opportunity for, for them to come. So... Um, look, there are there are ways to control docks in 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 your established grasses, um, but I suppose really really important if you are doing a receipt to go out with post emergent spray um, and control them at the seedling stage because it is much easier to control docks um, at the seedling stage in a new receipt compared to once they get established, and especially if you have clover and sward, it can be quite difficult to control them properly. Yeah, we have been working with, well, we've done some trials at the research farm in Wiltshire with whatever on their new product that's coming out that is um, uh, clover safe and, and got control. Uh, and that's been some interesting results there. And I think that's being launched with the next spring or next summer. So hopefully there is a product coming out that will help with receipts and, and got control. Uh, last couple of questions. Uh, are, there, are there any studies that support overseeding with plantain or chicory for their tap roots? Do you want me to? Uh, yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not aware of any studies, uh, any research work. Um, anecdotally, we've. Um, I think it's fair to say we've had we've struggled with chicory establishment into existing swords when you're overseeding. Um, it, it has been there has been some success with it, um, but we have struggled with chicory. Plantain seems to be more successful, um, and. Um, Obviously, the benefits of them in your lays once they're established uh, are, are proven. But uh, in terms of establishment, they are they are more successful to do at a full reseed stage than they are to introduce. I think that's probably the only overall. Uh, um, uh, that's probably the only rule, uh, overall comment I'd make. Then either of you got a different comment on that? Yeah, look, I mean, I'd agree with what you're saying there, Ben. In terms of um, where we have tried to establish them through oversowing um, very mixed results. They're also quite an expensive seed. Um, and, you know, if we think even about oversown clover, where we have ways to manage that and get very good establishment with clover, if we go out with a, a standard receipt with, with clover, we're talking about a kilo of clover in that. 
if you're going out with over sewn clover, we're probably talking about two to three kilos to get the same level of clover in the subsequent sport. So um, for your, your plantain or, or chicory trying to establish a true over sowing, you know, you probably have to increase your seeding rate. It actually makes it quite expensive. And if it doesn't work, then that's a bit of a cost. And we have seen mixed results out, out on farm um, and very, probably difficult. It's very difficult to get them established in the quantity that we see the benefits in the sward from those, if you understand what I'm saying. So. Last question tonight, how, how much will dock burden reduce dry matter yield? Um, this is something I, I've done on, on, on social media once or twice. Um, basically, the, the, the dock population, if you've got a percentage of docks of 15%, then you can expect about a 15% reduction in dry matter yield. Um, and the easiest way to measure it is to uh, pick a representative part of the field, drop uh, a coat in one corner, walk six yards one way, seven yards in another way, and the area between you is roughly 1% of an acre. If you count the number of dots in that area, then you'll get an idea of how much dot population you've got in a field. And roughly, once you get above 10%, you normally get about 1% reduction in dry matter yield for each dot. So it, they are worth controlling. Uh, as I said, as Mary said, it's not always easy, but it's something that uh, hopefully will get better soon. Um, and, uh, and and definitely worth controlling. Right, I think I think given that it's now ten minutes past, it's an hour and ten minutes. We'll wrap it up there.